Well, uh -huh. it says it's paused. Okay, excuse me. Yeah, now it's working. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. Actually, let me just say, Jeff, that I, I want to welcome everyone to this session. It's a very exciting session on recognizing the labor of OER work, providing guidelines for tenure and promotion policies and portfolios. And now I will mute myself and let our presenters uh, introduce themselves. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome to our panel session and thank you so much, Rebecca, uh, for the introduction. Um, if you cannot see our PowerPoint slides, that's good because we do not have any. We will be showing some links to various documents and chat that will help you out. Um, be sure to save those, bookmark them if you'd like. Uh, we'll go through introductions uh, real quick. I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the Program Director of Affordable Learning Georgia for the University System of Georgia. I'm here in Athens um, on lands that was originally um, Muskogee and Timucua land, uh, and I will pass it to Tiffany. Hi, I am Tiffany Tiarina. Um, I'm an instructor of technical communication at Kennesaw State University, uh, but I'm also the former program manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. And so I was involved in their tenure and promotion guidelines, which is why I'm here. Um, and I am also located in Athens. Hi, I'm Stephanie Buck. I'm the Director of Open Educational Resources at Oregon State University, and we're located in Corvallis, Oregon. I'm Amy Hoffer. I'm the Statewide Open Education Program Director with Open Oregon Educational Resources, and our mission is to promote textbook affordability for community college and university students and to facilitate widespread adoption of open, low-cost, high-quality materials. And um, we wanted to share an equity statement with the group before we get started to kind of um, ground what we're going to be talking about. Um, so the presenters on this panel recognize that um, what we're trying to do here is not meaningful unless we account for past inequities. Systemic racism has caused generations of harm. This shapes the experience of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color that live and learn in our states today. As institutions of higher education, we must attend to the impact our choices have on students. Our team provides tools and resources to make diversity, equity, and inclusion primary considerations when faculty engage with open course materials. We also continue to ask questions and learn together. We welcome being held accountable, and we're going to put our email addresses in the chat when we're done presenting, if you want to get in touch with any of us. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Jeff to get us started. Thank you. And please be thinking of uh, any questions that you will want to bring to us uh, by the end of the presentation, because we did make it deliberate that we will have a Q&A at the end. Uh, so as you've seen from the Open Texas theme, uh, OER labor is valuable. And in order to support this work, uh, the work that comes with creating OER, adopting it and completely transforming your class, uh, adapting it for the specific needs of your students, many organizations built incentive programs like grants or awards. Um, we have textbook uh, grants, uh, transformation grants, and continuous improvement grants in Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, others have worked with awards committees and student government associations uh, to recognize OER work in other ways. Now, recognizing OER work as part of a tenure and promotion portfolio gives faculty in particular a very specific and necessary kind of recognition. And that helps with the sustainability of open education practices, stuff that goes beyond what we can offer for grants, um, even beyond just the support that you can provide with your staff. And that's great, but there's one big problem. It isn't being recognized widely yet. And tenure promotion processes vary across institutions and departments. Uh, bringing something new into that process tends to brush up against risk aversion. Uh, everyone's policies and portfolios are different, and they all want to have the best policies and, of course, the best portfolios. Uh, so adding new things on either side, either as the creator of policies or as uh, the submitter of a tenure portfolio, it means taking a risk. So you need a bigger uh, group to really start recognizing this work and uh, providing some guidelines on how it can be used. So enter uh, an organization called Doers3. Um, they, that stands for Driving OER Sustainability for Student Success. 
Uh, it's a collaborative of state leaders and provincial leaders uh, just coming together to do stuff that a big group like that um, could, uh, could get done. Uh, They're addressing three big topics in workers right now. There's research, there's building capacity, and there's equity. Now the building capacity team is the one working on tenure and promotion because of course, uh, this is all about OER work and the ability to get that stuff done. Um, so they have been working for the past year or so on creating an OER and tenure and promotion matrix, uh, which Amy is sharing in the chat. So this is uh, a matrix that shows um, various types of OER work and how they fit in to different parts of a tenure and promotion uh, portfolio or towards policies that where you would recognize it. It's the first attempt to approach these problems from a grassroots perspective. Um, we're not telling everybody what to do. You shall make your tenure, tenure policies just like this, but here's how you can add OER work to your portfolio as faculty. And here's how your department can consider adding that OER work to their policies. Um, so yeah, in the first column, it's the type of work. Uh, then there's the evidence for completing that in the second column so that here's what you would expect in a portfolio. Um, and the third one uh, and the fourth one and the fifth one are the three common buckets that you have uh, for tenure and promotion. You have research, teaching, and service. There's a check mark in one of those if it fits. Um, Doers 3 is now making sure that uh, institutions and systems are aware of this matrix. They're also writing about it. Um, we're going to share an article from Inside Higher Ed that came out of this matrix. Um, and also the New England Board of Higher Education has a practitioner perspectives journal and there's an article in there for it too. Um, they're also tracking the different adaptations of the matrix. Uh, the first big one they tracked is the first one that we're gonna talk about today, but we're gonna go through a series of adaptations, um, mostly from us, but the first one I'm going to mention isn't from us. It's from Iowa State, uh, especially um, the lead on the project, Abby Elder. Uh, this adaptation of the matrix really shows a different focus. It focuses on advocacy on getting the word out about putting OER work in tenure and promotion across various stakeholders at an institution. Um, not only does it tell you who they are, it also tells you when you should contact them, um, usually like at a particular time or after a specific event, um, and then also how to talk to them. What kind of talking points do you want to bring up? Um, the tenure matrix itself is just an appendix in the Iowa State one, uh, which is really cool uh, that they're so focused on getting the word out. The matrix is almost secondary to them. Um, and they're also sharing out handouts and presentations within that adaptation that can help with advocacy um, and with teaching advocates on how to, how to do that. Uh, so that's the first one. And now we're actually going to talk about what we do. I'm going to pass this over to Tiffany to talk about Affordable Learning Georgia. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so uh, like elsewhere, like everywhere, um, there was a need in the university system of Georgia for, I'm sorry, <laughs> it never fails. The dog rings the bell when I start talking. <laughs> so um, the, hold on, I'm it's okay. The noise canceling is getting rid of most of it, too. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so there was a need in the University System of Georgia for help incorporating OER work um, and related work in tenure and promotion portfolios so that, that uh, people could get recognition for that important work. But the USG also had its own new challenges to meet when it came to tenure and promotion. Um, there were a few pretty big changes to uh, our tenure and promotion and post tenure review processes here. Um, and part of that was required categories. Um, and so it was this it was this whole big thing. It was all over the Chronicle and other academic news outlets. Um, people were talking about it everywhere probably still are, um, 
the the post tenure review side of that wasn't super relevant to us at affordable learning georgia but the new category that was added for tenure and promotion student success was directly related and so we sort of took that addition as this great opportunity to stick our noses stick our oer noses into tenure and promotion mm -hmm. um, by helping out our grantees and also other oer users in the usg find ways to fit their OER work um, into their portfolios. And so since Jeff was part of the Doers 3 group, um, he already knew that their guidelines were coming out with an open license. And so we did what we do best in open education and we revised it. Uh, so we took that Doers 3 version and modified mm -hmm. it to fit what tenure promotion looks like in the USG. Um, including revising the categories, uh, so adding in that student success category. Um, we broke down some of the activities and changed some of the activities column. Um, and we also added some, some other activities that uh, were based on what we do with our grant programs and our advocacy programs. Um, and so we also were making sure that we were uh, covering work at different at multiple levels of OER work. So we wanted to make sure that instructors, um, administrators, grants managers, um, reviewers, publishers, any kind of OER work that might need to look at tenure and promotion would have this resource to be in and be able to look at it and find some type of category that worked for them. And so then on the sort of technical side of things, we also decided to get a little bit fancier than a simple Word document and stick it into our instance of Manifold, uh, which OpenALG, um, it's an open repository for OER if you haven't seen it. I think a lot of us probably have seen some version of it. Um, but when, when we did that, that allowed us to leverage HTML to make our table look exactly the way we wanted it to without sacrificing accessibility. So we were able to sort of keep things categorized um, and subcategorized within that as well. And I think that that was really, uh, really helpful in helping people stay organized. Um, and then we implemented it, we shared it far and wide. Um, and I think one of the most important things about the original matrix and our version of it is that it goes with how we function at ALG. Uh, we don't make anyone do anything. We don't enforce, we don't create policies, um, but we're here to enable, we're here to support. Um, and so what Jeff was talking about where the matrix was designed to guide institutions in incorporating OER, um, it sort of went right along with the way that we function at ALG as well. So it turned out to be a really great opportunity. And I am going to pass it to Stephanie. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, in Oregon, under the guidance of Open Oregon Educational Resources, uh, a group of representatives from Oregon's public institutions discussed the topic of OER representation in tenure and promotion. And we discovered that our faculty, like all the other faculty that you've heard about, were struggling with the same issues, how to represent OER in the tenure and promotion dossier. And in this case, it wasn't so, it was similar to what other, um, what Tiffany and Jeff have talked about, but it was also, how do you actually describe your OER contributions in your dossier? So what, what's the verbiage? What's the language that you can use that people will understand? So we wanted to provide some guidance to faculty because we recognize that a critical part of sustaining the OER in Oregon is recognizing the contributions by the instructors who create and approve them as part of their professional work, which is basically what the Doers 3 document is all about. Now, as Tiffany and Jeff have mentioned, individual institutions or departments are going to differ in, uh, in their matrix from the categories. The original Doers 3 finds that most variations of tenure and promotion guidelines are based on teaching, research, and service categories. Although, as Tiffany pointed out, there could be special categories that your particular institution has. But we kept it with the basic Doers 3 categories. Um, because TNP processes are based on one's local institutions and one guidelines. It, it can get a little tricky, um, but our adaptation of the Doers 3 matrix, which Amy is sharing, includes excerpts from 
tenure and promotion portfolios that were successfully submitted at Oregon's public universities. And I want to just point out here that we, what we did is we solicited from faculty whom we knew who were going up for promotion and tenure, um, how they would share how they represented their, their OER in their dossier. And while few institutions have recognized open educational practices as deliverables towards promotion and tenure, we felt faculty in documenting their OER work should be encouraged to characterize their work using these terms to aid their colleagues in understanding their contribution. So we hope that seeing sample language will help the faculty think strategically about where their open educational contributions might be most valued and help us to frame those contributions. So we put a call out for this con these contributions from faculty that we knew at our institutions. And they might not always be faculty who are going up for promotion and tenure from assistant professor to associate professor. Some were, we got samples from people who were promoted from and say instructor to senior instructor or from associate professor to full professor. So it wasn't <clears throat> actually finding people who were going through the process of tenure and promotion at this time was a little bit tricky, but we felt that the verbiage that we could gather from the other folks, even if it wasn't strictly tenure and promotion, um, would be helpful as a sample for people to look at. And in developing this adapted matrix, we found that it was kind of a puzzle to figure out where to fit OER in the available categories. And your faculty will likely face the same issue in determining where to put different OER work into their portfolios. We hope that seeing more worked examples will enable faculty to make decisions that align with their own department and institution's best practices. And if you take a look at our um, matrix, our, the Oregon version of it, you'll see that we use the same categories. We said adopt, adapt, create, and improves learning, and that we have the same three buckets, the research, the teaching, and the service. And for each of these individual contributions using OER in the class or classroom or using open access research article or revising another OER's um, Oh, revising another's OER to be more relevant to the student needs, et cetera. If we could find an Oregon example, we put it on the in the very right-hand column. And it'll just say something like OIT1 or OSU3, meaning that that was the first or the third uh, example we got from our respective institutions. As you scroll down, you'll see the actual verbiage, both from the narrative and from the actual uh, dossier itself. So you can see how different faculty have represented that work uh, in, the, in their dossier in both, both narrative and dossier portions. Um, so again, we didn't find a lot of examples who are going through P&T like tenure folks, but we felt like that there were enough exam good examples that we could share so that other people would be inspired, hopefully, to use it. And part of the problem with finding people who have done this, who have successfully uh, incorporated their OER materials into their promotion and tenure uh, dossiers is that generally OER does not reflect the scholarship category. And that's, of course, where most people are. Um, are worried about when you're going up for tenure, for those of you who have been through the, the tenure and promotion process. Um, the other tricky part that we found is, is what to put where. And so deciding, we decided to just put things into one category. So you'll notice that, that um, the categories have multiple examples, but each example only shows up one time. But it's definitely possible that the examples could show up in different categories or in multiple categories. So we didn't want people to think that this was um, the absolute, you had to use this verbiage if you were using this category. Again, these are just examples that we wanted to share and so that people could see how, how they could possibly represent their work in their pre-motion and tenure document. And we have this up on a website um, it's available for people to to take a look at, and we hope that that people will and, um, 
find it beneficial. And now I will turn it back over to Amy, who's going to talk about recommendations and next steps. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about what you all in the room here can potentially do to take some action. And I'm going to talk about this at three different levels of action. Um, individual faculty who are navigating promotion and tenure. OER champions, so whether that's librarians or department chairs, administrators, members of disciplinary associations, senators, union reps, people who look at bylaws, um, you know, people who are not currently going through the process themselves, but might um, be able to nudge um, your institution towards change. And then last, um, community-wide contributions that go beyond an institution. So um, starting with um, the category of individuals who are navigating um, tenure and promotion, um, I want to acknowledge that um, this can really be the third rail. There's a lot of anxiety around these processes for good reason, because so much is at stake. So um, my first suggestion is a really small one that may even seem too big to some people, and it just talk to your colleagues. Um, and, um, you know, that that in some departments might just be too much. And if that's the case, um, then, you know, I think that, you know, that is understood, right? Um, no one's asking people to um, put their job security on the line. Um, but if you are able to talk to your colleagues and you are finding some receptivity to these ideas um, going on, some additional ideas would be to add the matrix as an agenda item at a faculty meeting in your department or um, show it to someone who's on faculty senate or in your union or your faculty association. Um, you can share it with people who are active in your professional association. Um, and starting at the very beginning of the spectrum of like, just talk to a colleague and at the other end of the spectrum, the boldest action that an individual could take, I would say would be to really try to implement one or more elements of the matrix in your own portfolio. So, um, you know, of course, um, I would recommend hedging your bets, so to speak, um, and to use your OER work if it's a really untested case. Um, use it as supplemental evidence. Um, don't rely on it as your main evidence of impact if you're going first um, in your department or in your institution, but just including it might start to establish a precedent. Um, so those are some ideas for individuals who are going through the process. Um, in terms of things that OER champions on campus might be able to do, um, my, my recommendation here would be to be the one to bring the matrix, the doers three matrix into those conversations um, and, you know, start asking those questions as a person in a leadership role or a champion role um, to determine, like, is there receptivity either among individuals or among um, people who might have a little bit of decision-making power, um, or what would have to change in order for there to be greater acceptance? Everything that we have shared so far today um, has an open license on it, and that means that you are welcome to take it as the basis for your own adaptation at your own institution. Um, this is really the strength of the open ed movement, right? So you can tailor it to your um, exact needs at your institution or your department. Um, so um, another thought would be to um, share the matrix rather than like in these sort of formal conversations to share it more informally um, with individual faculty who you know might be open to piloting a change and then offer support as they go through their portfolio process. We're seeing an example of this in Oregon um, where an OER champion on campus is um, you know, offering like, what can I do to help you include this in your portfolio for someone who's already decided to do that? Um, whether that would be you know, giving things a first read um, while they're in the draft stage or you know, doing a bit of legwork with administrators to find out um, you know, how it'll be received, that kind of thing. Um, or thinking even a little bit bigger, um, an OER champion can try to identify a department that might be open to a guideline revision process that explicitly recognizes OER. Um, so that would be sort of taking it um, one level 
more, right, to, to bring a conversation to an entire department. Um, there are also a few suggestions that came out of the Oregon adaptation process that Stephanie described, and I want to just walk you through what those um, suggestions were. So um, this is like in a paper when you say future research, it's like the things that we thought would be really cool, but we didn't do them ourselves, and we hope that somebody else will do them and share back. Um, so we thought it would be great to have um, guidance on fitting equity, diversity, and inclusion work into the matrix um, because it's often really entwined with open education work. Um, it's often very central to institutional mission statements and other kinds of institutional documentation. Um, and we, we just felt that it would be good to sort of pull that forward and be more explicit about um, where it might fit in. We would love to see an adaptation of the matrix specifically for library faculty. Um, so library faculty that um, do have a tenure and promotion process, um, the work that librarians do is often different enough from disciplinary faculty that it already feels sometimes like a square peg in a round hole. So we thought that having um, a version of the matrix specifically for library faculty could be very useful for folks in that situation. We would love to see an example of somebody really mapping the matrix to their own specific institutional TNP guidelines. Um, just that one-to-one -one map we thought could be really illuminating. Um, and whoever did that map might be also finding um, gaps in the matrix or places of great compatibility in their own guidelines or potentially places where you would wanna especially advocate for change um, in your institutional guidelines. Um, and then if you are going to start advocating for change in specific places, um, creating templates for wording updates to your guidelines that are explicitly inclusive of OER, and then sharing those templates out, right? Like people are really looking for worked examples, as Stephanie was saying. Um, so having that language um, in sort of policy ease is very helpful. Um, and then we would also love to see um, a sort of more attention and more guidance on non-tenure track faculty and other types of career professionals. Um, the way that the matrix is written, um, it's really agnostic about who you are. It's, it's a very inclusive, um, as Jeff said, grassroots kind of document. It's non-prescriptive, um, but it would be nice to sort of pull forward the needs of non-tenure track faculty. Um, so those were the suggestions that came out of the Oregon adaptations that champions can take. Um, and I'm still sticking with champions here for a minute. Um, so administrators, the people who approve portfolios, right? Like you start um, with your own department and then it gets passed up for review um, and uh, potentially at multiple levels and it goes to the president and then you finally get that letter that you're so relieved to receive. So if you're in one of those layers of approval and if you are creating a favorable environment for including OER in portfolios, Please do not be quiet about that. <laughs> if you are listening right now, let people know, relieve that anxiety that people feel, right? Um, so that would be something to um, do a lot of communication about. Um, you know, if you are taking that top-down approach um, or just a permissive approach, people really do need to know that in the planning stages. Um, and finally, the last piece for champions is that a lot of faculty's professional service includes leadership in your disciplinary association. Um, and so those folks can start to do work outside of your department, but that might have um, more of a trickle down impact um, because of the role that those associations play. So a disciplinary association can write a statement um, or can let their members know in other ways that your community of practice recognizes and validates OER work. Um, an association can create resources that members can bring back to their administrators or include as supplemental evidence in their portfolio, right? Like that, the discipline can say, this is something that we validate, right? And have that that people can share um, when they are making their case. Um, so last, I want to offer a few ideas for community-wide contributions that go beyond your own institution. Um, and one of those is please share your successes. We want to cheer you on um, and people really want examples. Um, so any kind of documentation, any wording, any success stories, please share. 
Um, another way to do this is through events. So for example, at last year's Open Education Week, Oregon hosted a faculty panel to share use cases and generate discussion. Um, this was a really wonderful um, panel. We had great panelists, one of whom was non-tenure track faculty um, who shared their experience. And Jeff is gonna share the link to that archived webinar. So this is an example of how you can sort of do event programming around um, this idea of advancing the conversation on your campus or in your system or state. And then um, the last um, idea that I'm going to offer is to submit a case study proposal because the Doers 3 project is creating an edited book of case studies. And I'm gonna quote um, the blurb for the book by collecting case studies from those who have experience, Doers 3 seeks to provide as many examples from as many types of institutions as possible so that those looking for answers to this problem can find solutions that speak to their particular issues. The goal of this project is ultimately to be the first stop for anyone asking, how can I make open education work count toward the job security of myself and others? The abstracts should be no more than 250 words, they're due um, October 24th, and case study authors will be compensated for their work, and all accepted submissions will be peer reviewed. Um, so that's another opportunity to share in your community. So um, I can see that we do have a question in chat. Um, we're also going to put our email addresses in the chat in just a moment. Um, and let's take a minute for Q&A. We have plenty of time. Right now we've got... Um, at least 15 minutes, I think, if I'm doing the math correctly. Um, and if we sort of run dry, we also have prepared questions for all of you. Um, so we're not letting you off the hook if you don't have questions for us. So yeah, uh, let's get our emails in there and then we will go right into the chat because we're already seeing some, some great questions. So uh, Tessie Torres uh, asked us, um, okay, so uh, she is the University of Texas at El Paso OER librarian. Um, she shared the matrix and had conversations with uh, administrators and experienced pushback from some of the members. Have any speakers dealt with admin pushback? And if yes, how did you respond to it? So I asked if there were, if there was like some particular stuff that they were pushing back at. One concern was that OER was not legitimate. And another was that OER, was an opportunity to publish material that veered from the university or department's admission. That's interesting. Have any of us experienced that kind of pushback? I think the pushback that I received when I shared this matrix with our promotion and tenure uh, group was not so much um, that they didn't see OERs as being something that could be legitimately placed into a, into a dossier, but that they just weren't sure which bucket it fits into. And because each, each department kind of defines scholarship research and teaching a little bit differently. Um, there was some confusion about that. Uh, like how how do we how do we acknowledge this? But I didn't get any pushback in terms of, oh, we don't think OERs are, are legit. Um, I have had that conversation with some folks. And um, you know, the, that's a whole nother uh, another discussion topic. But in terms of an OER, um, not so much that kind of pushback. Yeah, I think um, getting at the issues that Tessie said were raised about the legitimacy of OER, you know, on that individual faculty level, the Open Education Network's review workshop model, um, I have found to be very effective in saying, you know, I'm not advocating for the quality of any particular resource. You're the subject matter expert. Um, we're offering stipends to take a deep dive, review this and see if it meets your standards and meets your learning objectives and the needs of your students, right? 
Um, but it sounds like this administrator had legitimacy questions. And in that case, I think um, it would really be um, a matter of the faculty providing evidence like the OER work that they did, did it have a peer review process? Is there evidence of impact that aligns with what's actually in your guidelines of what you're supposed to be demonstrating, right? Um, and knowing that you're um, coming up against a potentially skeptical audience, like I was saying, like um, including it potentially, but um, having other evidence of impact for the same category so that it's not the only um, piece of that section of your portfolio. Um, in terms of um, veering from the university and department mission, um, Whitney said that they were curious about what parts of the mission would go against OER. And I think that that is a spot on question that gets to the heart of the matter. So in Oregon, I've been able to advocate for our statewide OER program because I did an analysis, I made a spreadsheet that showed that every one of our public institutions has wording in their institutional statements that has to do with both um, access and with equity. And I can show that OER work is helping advance both of those goals at the same time. So really taking a close look to try to understand, you know, where, where are you seeing the conflict? Um, and is there any sort of misunderstanding that we need to um, do some education around? Um, I'm curious if anyone else has thoughts about this. I mean, that's exactly it. Uh, for us, we have a university press that follows university press guidelines and does open textbooks uh, and does peer reviewed open textbooks double blind. So um, when folks need some sort of evidence that their authoring work is legitimate and they've gone through the, our, our university press's peer review system, the press can provide a letter that says, here's exactly how uh, our peer review process works. And this went through peer review and they did provisions based on it. Um, and it winds up being really good evidence that way. But that's not everything. Uh, some grantees are creating stuff on their own. And then in that case, it's a little bit different. And the, what Amy said about post-production peer review in the Open Textbook Network is exactly right. If you go to the um, Open Textbook Library and see the reviews there, the name of the professor and the institution are linked right to the review. And the review is based on a rubric and it goes down a whole bunch of different categories. So it really answers the, the questions um, of quality that you're that you're looking for. Um, Rebecca, uh, uh, who is our wonderful host today, uh, said, "I'm curious whether resistance comes more from faculty or administrators. Are there particular disciplines beyond libraries where it gain more traction and support?" Um, I'll say over here that it's really tough to get a political science department to all do something department wide. Uh, they love to do things on their own and uh, be their own bosses. But also, we have a public policy place uh, with some great leaders who saw OER as an equity boosting thing that was necessary. So at uh, Georgia State, the Andrew Young School of Public Policy is trying to get their courses to go OER. Uh, so you get these contrasts at some places like, no, no, we do our own thing over in poli sci. And then at other places it's like, but this is the right thing to do. So we're going to work towards it. Um, we've got an IT department that created their own Z degrees through a series of uh, grants that they just beautifully applied for and did great projects on. And yet sometimes it, it really depends on the leaders in that department. Um, I want to pop in with Amber's question. Um, I, I'm curious if you've seen any examples of theses and or dissertations distributed through OER. I wonder if that may also be a pathway for legitimization. I love that thinking about um, sort of the pipeline of, you know, our, our next professors and our next um, instructors. Um, and I want to share a link to an example where um, capstone students um, in a master's program at the University of Oregon worked with our higher, higher education coordinating commission in Oregon and through them with me with our program um, to do an analysis of our no cost low cost schedule designation implementation 
like very shortly after um, that bill was passed. And um, their findings led directly to another piece of policy in the next legislative session. Um, so that's one example that I can give. And um, Amber, I just think that's such a cool idea to pursue and I hope you pursue it. So let me just share that link here. So I'm going to ask the other panelists Elizabeth's question. Is anyone on the panel or in the session aware of OER as a performance goal for faculty within state legislation? We believe Minnesota has this in place. Are there other states? So, and this would never be a policy goal in Oregon because this of is academic not freedom. ours, yeah. uh, but this is definitely something that happened in Rhode Island. Uh, the Rhode Island governor issued uh, a thing called a governor's challenge um, to uh, get a certain amount of open textbooks in courses by a particular year. Uh, I don't think that that lasted too long, but it was a nice motivator uh, for organizations to take a look at OER uh, just by having the governor talk about it again. I'm going to read out Bruce's question. Oh, okay. um, at my university, the administration supports OER, but many of the departments don't. Do you have any advice to get OER related verbiage to trickle down from university standards to departmental standards? I've been having a lot of conversations with our individual institutions in the system lately. And one of the more alarming things I heard uh, at one institution was that the administration does a great job of shielding the institution from uh, system-wide initiatives. The idea being that this stuff is invasive and not welcome in our traditional department in which we do our thing our certain way. And I kind of feel like this is around the same thing, that there may be a motivation among departments to say, we are different. Um, then what's going on up there? Uh, particularly if you have an administration with a lot of turnover, they're just kind of, the department stays steadfast and you have a revolving door elsewhere. So like, I think here, it's just a lot of conversations, uh, really talking to folks about why OER matters as opposed to why the university standards matter. Um, it, it starts to sound a little bit more like compliance when you're coming from a standards or strategic plan point of view, then here's how you can help your students and here are some cool examples uh, that happen in your discipline. I think it would be, I think just more outreach and more conversations is just about the only thing that I could suggest. Yeah, I'm working with, um... My supervisor, who has um, good contacts with the colleges, to go to each and individual college and talk about. We ran the Florida survey at Oregon State, so we could get some numbers for you know how many of our students aren't purchasing their textbooks and all that kind of good stuff. And I'm going to share all of that with the different colleges. I'm going to sneak tenure and promotion into that particular conversation because that's going to come up. I know, so I might as well be prepared for it. Um, so if you have somebody maybe who can get you into some college conversations, some college departmental meetings, that might be another good way to start. I think also um, making, I guess, it, it's helpful when more than just the administration is positive about OER. I mean, there are other groups on campus that may be involved in 
making OER happen on the campus. And so uh, the example that's coming to mind is um, at my current and also former university, because I worked there before, we um, we had some issues with our grants office, um, just being very sort of negative about working with the ALG grants um, because it created a lot of extra work for them because they weren't technically like federal grants. Um, which they're not, they're not federal grants, they're not the same kind. But um, that sort of negative attitude that came out of that office um, sometimes would, it made things difficult for uh, teams that wanted to apply for grants um, and has made the process for applying for grants at that institution significantly more complicated <laughs> now because they have a lot of approvals to go through. Um, and so I think I think that attitude has changed a little bit because um, there has been some turnover, but having that positivity and encouragement from all involved groups on campus is really important. That kind I of goes, to... oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna do a different question, so please jump in. Oh, I was actually gonna go to it too. Um, the uh, Margaret Katembe's question. That was the one, yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, her uh, issue here is that, uh, you know, there's an administrator that says OER will take business away from the university bookstore if the faculty uh, adopts a golden textbook. How would you address this? Why don't you start, Amy? Well, um, there were a couple of really great responses in the chat about how margins on textbooks are pretty small compared to, you know, like snacks and sweatshirts and other swag. Um, but in a community college setting, um, textbook sales really do make up the bulk of bookstore or campus store sales as opposed to like a university with a pretty active um, sports culture. So that answer, um, you know, your mileage may vary um, on those kinds of considerations. But um, the other question that I would have, and of course, you would never say this directly back to the administrator um, in so many words, but let's play it out. So are you then suggesting that we should artificially raise the price of textbooks in order to support the campus store, right? Like should students pay more in order to help the bottom line of the campus store? Um, and of course that's absurd, right? The um, students really need those course materials in order to succeed. Um, we have to take faculty sort of at face value that required textbooks are required because students need them. Um, and so um, the campus store, um, manager i think um needs in that case probably support in talking to the cfo or talking to other upper admin about um, what's not working for students about that self-support model and is there some innovative change that could happen um, that can help students have what they need in order to succeed in their courses um, without um, harming that um you know, piece of the campus operation. And I wanna also acknowledge that when you have a third party store, um, things can get a little bit different depending on what's in your contract. But um, more to the point, um, that third party store, um, especially if it's a publicly traded company, um, their um, obligation is to their shareholders, right? And they have a very specific mission that may not really be aligned with the mission of a community college or a university. Um, so that's just another place where that disconnect may be happening. But Margaret, this is such a great question and a huge issue that you're raising. Um, so Jeff, do you want to jump in? Well, yeah, I mean, there's when I see administrators who support OER talking to administrators who bring up this question, the, the ultimate question from the administrators supporting OER is, well, what how, why does your organization exist right if it's for student success then you are looking at the best ways in which you can uh, raise student success raise educational equity um if that is through extra revenue uh through the bookstore that's going to be a really weird justification um and i think that organizations that already are very geared towards student success are going to wind up uh, kind of organizationally going towards OER. Uh, we often kind of go in between the research university mindset of we need to be the best, we need to be ranked, and the, uh, the 
the public university and college uh, mindset of we need to increase student success. Um, one of our institutions, kind of in contrast to what was happening at the grants office at the other one, um, they have someone on our champions team who's always at every single meeting uh, so that they know what's going on and they can provide advice back to us. Um, you know, we're always reaching out to them being like, you know, how how is this uh, agreement for our grant looking? Is there anything you would change about it? Like, how can we make this more understandable? And they have great feedback for us because they're also getting the word out about uh, OER to the rest of their faculty and staff, just because they're all aligned towards student success. So it's, it, it is definitely about the motivation of your organization. And uh, sometimes it, it it, sometimes it varies uh, from institution to institution, for sure. Um, we've got a question um, from Xanthine Perillon. Uh, will NCLC no cost and low cost be formalized and operationalized? Um, over in Georgia, we have a uh, uh, designation you can put on a course section. Uh, these use no cost materials and these use low cost materials. Um, we haven't based too much uh, of our like big data reading into it though, because the processes differ so much at our institutions as to who is putting these into uh, the course schedule. Uh, at one at one place, it might be directly the faculty are putting them in, and if you teach with OER, you are putting no cost. And at another place, it's one person in one office doing it for the whole institution, and you got to call them on the phone five times just to get the designator in there. Um, so we want to base more of our measurements on those designations, but it's not quite there yet. And I know that Amy has a ton to share on this um, over in Oregon. I was trying to be efficient by addressing James's question. <laughs> so I missed where we were at. <laughs> um, is this about the no cost and low cost schedule designations? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if that was a question about um, operationalization or implementation in Texas in particular that the person was asking about. Yeah, that could be. Um, but let me just grab the link to the um, course marking book that um, Michelle worked on, um, because that is um, such a great resource. One second while I grab that. Um, while also, you're doing that, um, since we're running low on time, do we want to go ahead and put our emails in the chat so that people have it before they disappear? Oh, yeah, we kind of buried them way back there. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. I'll, uh, I'll do that. Uh, and be sure to check out what Rebecca's sharing as well, um, that Doers 3 did some work on uh, bookstore campus relationships too. Oh, there's a cool page on that. Excellent, that's all four of us. Um, I do wanna thank our presenters. This was, you can see the interest you have generated here among all these wonderful colleagues who joined this session. Um, really remarkable information, incredible links. I kept copying, opening them, copying them. I can't wait to dive deeper. And I'm sure that's true for so many of our um, colleagues. So thank you very much, Jeff, Tiffany, Amy, and Stephanie, really incredibly valuable information. I'm going to hit stop recording. I hope all of you will be able to join other sessions today, tomorrow, and on Friday. We're very excited to have everybody here. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, everybody. And thank you, Rebecca, for hosting. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Stephanie, Amy, Tiffany, uh, for a